the well that never runs dry. Drink up his water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for.
sight was gone and fears possessed me. Good morning, Triangle Grace Church, those of you who happen to be here in the sanctuary and those who are joining us uh, via Facebook, we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. We pray that uh, God's blessing will rest on you as we uh, come together to worship, to hear God's word, and also to come to God's uh, table. Uh, what a privilege it is uh, to be able to come and share in the Lord's Supper together today. So uh, we're glad you're here. A few announcements as we prepare to enter into worship this morning. First, uh, Ash Wednesday, which is one week from this Wednesday, uh, we're planning to have two services of worship, and we're planning that they will be in person. Uh, you can come and join us here in the sanctuary at noon or at 6 o'clock. The noontime service will also be uh, broadcast via Facebook. So if you're not comfortable coming out to worship quite yet, that's okay. Uh, you can join in in that way. And we're going to share together in the Lord's Supper again uh, on that occasion as well. Just going to be a brief service of worship, more of a devotional kind of service as we prepare ourselves to enter into the Lenten season. Uh, also, speaking of the Lenten season, we're doing a a church-wide study uh, during Lent called He Chose the Nails. It's based on a book by Max Licato. Uh, we have a study guide that is available to you. If you haven't gotten your study guide yet, uh, you can get one of those uh, through the church office. They're $5, uh, or we'll give it to you free, whichever way works for you. Uh, and we'd love to have you participate in a small group in terms of doing this. If you're not yet in a small group, if you let the church office know, uh, we will be happy to get you plugged in somewhere. There's going to be a group that meets on Wednesday evening when I normally do my Bible study at 6 o'clock. I'm going to be running a group 
around that study as well. So if you just want to join us, uh, send me an email, ray at trianglegrace.org, and uh, let me know that you'd like to be in the Wednesday evening study. Uh, if that time doesn't work for you, then we'll find another place for you as well. Uh, I'll be preaching on the themes of that study throughout uh, Lent, so we want everybody to be a part. If you can't be in a group, if you can't uh, come online in those sorts of ways, we still would love for you to participate at home. And so we can uh, make those books available to you, or we can let you know where you can obtain one as well. Some of you who perhaps are uh, living in other states might want to be a part of this as well. We'd love for you to join us, and we can tell you how you can easily order one of those books. Uh, at this time, we're grateful to have Dennis Stiles going to come and give us a minute for mission. So listen up as uh, Dennis brings a word to us. Good morning, Triangle Grace Church. Here and wherever you are, I want to share two things today. One is a blessing, and that is that for over a year and a half, we've had a brand new sound system in this sanctuary and downstairs. Part of that upgrade has included um, videography and an ability to actually live stream this service, which, as it turns out, is the way we can predominantly provide this worship service to you all out there. We're glad to be able to do that, and it's clearly an evidence of God's blessing. But the second thing I want to talk about is this does not happen by itself. We have an, a marvelous crew of technologists who are bringing you the sound and videography as we speak. I can see many of them right now. They are fantastic and dedicated uh, witnesses to God, and we need more of them. We need your help. We need some backup so that we can seamlessly provide this service to you all uh, each and every time we have a service. So I'd like for you to prayerfully consider being part of our team. Technology background is not required. We'll teach you everything you need to know, and it's a lot of fun. So I encourage you to think about this. It's a wonderful way to love and serve the Lord. When you take a, a look at your church bulletins and publications in the coming weeks, you're going to see some advertisements about this. I encourage you to contact me with any kinds of questions you might have, and let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Well, let's worship the Lord this morning. Hear these words from Galatians. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your faithful love and for your power. You multiplied the loaves and the fish to feed 5,000. You walked on water and you saved Peter when he took his eyes off of you. We praise you, Lord, for your love, for your gift of grace. We thank you, Lord, for your church where we may gather with confidence knowing that you are with us and you connect us one to another and to yourself, the true vine. Lord, help us to worship you and adore you this day, to enjoy you, to glorify you. We pray in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. If you are able, please let us stand together right where you are and sing This is Amazing Grace. Thank you. 
Join together saying what we believe with the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated here and I uh, want to invite at home uh, any of our youngest disciples to come a little bit closer to the screen so I can talk with you for just a moment. There's something that I've noticed about you, by the way, and that is, uh, even though I'm not able to see you very much these days, I've noticed it in the past and I'm sure that when I see you again, I will notice it uh, again. And that is, there are certain things that you do, there are certain actions that you take. Sometimes it's the way you walk, sometimes it's the way you hold your hands, sometimes it's even the way that you speak. You remind me of your moms and your dads. Uh, that may not make you feel great, but it's really not such a bad thing. Uh, I had a friend in seminary years ago, and I can still remember, there was a big open field that was right beside the place where we lived, and they were walking across this field, and as I was walk, watching them, here my friend and then his little boy who was five years old, as they were walking, they looked exactly the same, uh, the, just a miniature version of the dad walking across this field, and uh, I noticed that in some of you, that you walk and use your hands, that sort of thing like your parents. Well, the reason why I bring that up today is that the passage of Scripture that I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit talks about that. How do people know, how do we know that we're really followers of Jesus? How do we know that, that God has taken care of us and have adopted us into his family? And the answer that we find in Scripture is that it happens through us walking like Jesus walked. Now, that doesn't mean literally walking like Jesus walked. What it means is doing the things that Jesus did. That's one of the sure signs that you're a follower of Jesus, doing the things that Jesus did. When Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest command, what did he say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so one of the things we can do to show that we're walking like Jesus is just loving our neighbors, whether it's the kids who are in your neighborhood or maybe the ones who are on the, on the screen uh, on your classroom right now, or ones that eventually you'll get to see when you get to go back to school or, or as we end up getting through winter and finally getting to summer and you're out and able to play. Showing your love is one of the sure ways of showing that you are a follower of Jesus. Just like I can see a little bit of your parents in you, I hope that you'll be able to see a little bit of Jesus in all of us as we seek to follow him. We're going to pray this morning, and as we do so, let me bring a couple of folks to your particular attention. Randy uh, Pafford lost his mom this past week. We want to keep 
Randy and Jill and their family, especially in prayer. If you've been keeping up with uh, Ken Van Dalen, you know that he has now moved to step down. Uh, some things have gone in a good direction uh, in terms of that, but he needs to get much stronger so that he can go to Duke Regional to their rehabilitation facility, which would be the best thing uh, his family believes for him. So let's keep Ken and his family especially in prayer. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord as we pray this morning. Gracious Father, we thank you for today. Even with rain coming down, even with it being kind of chilly and dreary, we thank you for today, for the opportunity to gather here and to gather in other places to worship you and to seek to bring you honor through the lives that we lead. We know what it is like to walk in darkness where our path is hidden and our anxiety is high. We recognize that you have given us a great gift by calling us out of that darkness and into your marvelous light. Thank you for lifting the heavy burden of our sin that weighed down upon us. Thank you for infusing us with peace and with joy. Thank you for adopting us into your family and giving us life in you and life together. We confess that we continue at times to turn back toward the darkness. We hold back our complete commitment to you and to your kingdom. So we pray that you would forgive us once again for clinging to a past that was plagued by our own pride and our own self-centeredness. Once again, turn our eyes upon Jesus and draw us close to yourself and help us to understand the humility that's necessary to receive all the gifts that you've given us. Lord, this has been a long season of pain in many ways. We yearn to be together with family and friends. We, we miss handshakes. We miss hugs. We miss visiting homes. And we miss even visiting folks in the hospital or the nursing homes. We miss being able to stand beside each other in times of need. We're grateful that we are not walking this journey alone. We do sense your presence, and we're confident in your guidance. And so we pray that you would just give us the faith to take each next step. We pray especially for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are struggling with mental health issues, which have been made even worse because of the conditions of our day. We pray for those grappling with addictions. We pray for those who are dealing with constant chronic pain. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray for those who feel trapped on a treadmill of performance. We pray for those who can't seem to receive or accept your blessing. In the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak once again your strong word of grace into our lives. Lives that have been broken but have been healed through the work of Jesus. So indeed continue bringing that healing and peace as only you can. Hear our prayers this morning and hear us now as together we pray the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are pleased this morning to have a group of our choir folks who are going to come and bring our special music today. Washed in his blood, the 
this is my story. Oh, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. sure which group you are, but I know we've got several groups now as we've uh, kind of shifted things down to make it uh, so that we're socially distanced, but we're grateful for all those who come and share music with us week by week. Last week we talked about what I called three deceptions or three lies that had made their way into the early church to which uh, John was writing uh, what may have been a letter, but it perhaps was an address or even a sermon. Uh, the first deception was characterized like this. If we say we have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Uh, the second was, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And the third deception, sort of similar to the second, but a little different, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Well, we know that denying our sin is not an adequate answer uh, for our sin problem. In fact, it's no answer at all. Uh, when we refuse to acknowledge our sin, we allow that sin to continue to control our lives and rob us of the joy of our salvation that God intends for his children to enjoy. You kind of think about it this way. If you have some disease... 
It's detrimental to your overall well-being to ignore its symptoms and pretend that that disease simply does not exist. See, acknowledging the disease is the first step to receiving help, the very help that you need. And what we know is that Jesus has already taken care of our sin problem. The cure is available, and the invitation of the gospel is to receive the cure that God has for us in Jesus Christ. Now, there were some in that early church who refused to admit that they had a problem. Uh, we talked about this kind of false Greek notion that the body and the spirit were somehow separate from one another, and so it didn't really matter what you did with the body, so kind of sin was okay in terms of the carnal sense, but, but as long as you kept your spirit okay, and I'm not sure how you even do that, but, but that was the thought process that was beginning in that day. Later on in the history of the church, that same thought process would take on uh, the form of a couple of heresies that have been dealt with in the church for years and years. Uh, but it seems that some of John's uh, readers had bought into this kind of idea. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to dig a little deeper into the cure uh, as we continue to look at John's thoughts concerning the effects of sin on the lives of believers. And we'll see a bit of repetition here. And I, whenever I see repetition in Scripture, particularly in the same book in Scripture, that's a really good sign to know that the writer wants you to really pay attention. Repetition means, hey, you need to get this. And I think that this is John's way of telling the, the early church and telling us this is absolutely critical that we get this right. So we're going to turn in our Bibles to uh, 1 John chapter 1 and looking at, uh, or chapter 2 rather, and looking at verse 1. 1 John chapter 2 and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. As we come to this part of God's Word, let me invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, what a gift it is that we have this Word that we can hold in our hands and know that it is your Word to us. God breathed, spoken through the power of your Holy Spirit, written by human authors who were under the inspiration of that same Spirit. And so we pray that as you breathe this word out long ago through the writer John, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would breathe it into us as we seek to be followers of Jesus in this day. And all this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by, <coughs> by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. The image that comes to my mind when I think about this passage and what John is seeking to get across to his hearers uh, is the child that comes to the dinner table with dirty hands. Uh, and they're obviously dirty hands. And the parent looks at the hands and says, hey, uh, you need to go wash your hands before you eat your dinner. But the child insists that his or her hands are clean. Uh, and when pressed, the child says, well, I haven't done anything to get them dirty. The evidence is clear. Look at those dirty hands. But the denial is real nonetheless. You see, there's a rebellion against the truth. But isn't that often how we operate? Granted, a part of the problem is culture. 
Ours and many that have come before us rebel against the notion that there even is something that's called objective truth. We rebel against that notion uh, concerning what it constitutes to be clean. Does clean really even exist? You know, if all things are relative, what is clean after all? We see this all the way back in the Old Testament. If you go back to the book of Judges, you'll, you'll find m several times this phrase that's repeated, there was no king in Israel. And what that basically means is, you know, God had always been the king of Israel and, and the people had turned away from God. So there was no king in Israel. And then this statement follows, and each person did that which seemed right in his or her own eyes. It's a picture of relativism. Each person has their own idea of truth and operates out of that understanding. And aren't we seeing that in our world of today? The belief that there really is no absolute truth. You see, according to the definition of relativism, truth is tied to the culture and the current society or historical context. So truth changes as culture changes. No objective standard. So each group has to come up with their own definition of truth. And truly, that is no standard at all. I can tell you for sure that if I get to make up my rules, I can promise you that according to my rules, I will always be right and you will always be wrong. And my guess is that according to your rules, it will be just the reverse. You'll always be right, and I will always be wrong. And I think that's why there are many in our day that just consider themselves to be okay. <clears throat> if I don't see my hands as being dirty, then they are not dirty. I set my own standard. The other variation on this theme is to use other people as our standard of comparison. Oh, my hands may be dirty, but, but they're not as dirty as your hands. And so I'm okay with my level of dirtiness. Do you see how we continue to struggle with some of the same issues that were evident in the early church? What is truth? Where do we find it? What do we do with it when we do have it? John desperately wants those early believers not to follow this false teaching that has come into that early church that basically says there's no objective standard. He knows they need to see the reality of their sin before God because that's the only way that their sin problem can be taken care of. And I think he does this by first and foremost holding before them what I would call the ideal. In chapter 2 and verse 1, he writes, my little children. Now, when he writes that, he's writing it as a term of endearment. He's not, he's not talking down to them or not, he's not trying to hammer this down on them either. Uh, he's, he's talking to them in a loving way. Obviously, he cares for these believers. So he addresses them in love and then he places before them this ideal. And the ideal is this. He says, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. Well, that's the ideal, that you may not sin. And wouldn't we all love that? Uh, if suddenly sin were no longer an option in our lives. Uh, a time's coming when sin will be vanquished. Uh, that's when the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness. And we certainly yearn for that day. But I think John is holding out this ideal and in effect saying, I wish you had that now. I so wish you had it now. I don't want you to fall into sin. He doesn't want them to experience the heartache and the separate that comes from separation from God that sin can produce. Remember the definition of sin is just to miss God's mark. Uh, sin is living in a way that is less than what God desires for us. Uh, and sin causes us to walk away from rather than toward God. It's living below his purpose and plan. And often the way that that is manifest is that it, it pulls us away from God. And John's desire is that, is that your desire and my desire would be that, that we would not sin. John recognizes an objective standard of right and wrong. 
And he points to that standard as being uh, the result of the creator who has set things in place. And he says, the ideal is just don't sin. That's really what I hope for you. But he knows human nature. And he goes on and immediately says, but if anyone does sin, see, that's going to be the reality. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. John recognized that as long as we are continuing to walk on this earth, we will experience the reality of sin. So we need to know, where does that leave us? What should happen if and when we sin, even though we recognize ourselves as being followers of Jesus? And that's what I think John wants us to understand in this passage. Where do we stand in all of this? He wants us to know there's already a cure. God has put in place all things that are necessary to deal with our sin. We don't have to worry about whether sin puts us out of God's reach. You know, some folks think, you know, I've just, it's, whatever I did was so bad, it, God cannot reach me here. No, there's nothing that can put us outside of God's reach. And he also wants us to understand that God is not going to change his mind about us. Uh, as we turn away from him from time to time, God continues to pursue us as the loving father. This is a truth that we can count on, an objective reality that deals with our dilemma. If we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, to unpack what that means, I'm going to turn our attention for a few moments uh, to two theological words uh, that have been claimed by the church to help us understand how salvation and forgiveness and growing in Christ, how those all work. And we've talked about these many times before, and the two words I'm going to use are justification and sanctification. Doctrines, by the way, are simply biblical truths that are based on the full scope of Scripture. Um, we look at all of Scripture and we come to certain conclusions, and those become our doctrines. That's really where our confessional standards come from. We look at all of Scripture. See, you can't look uh, and say, okay, what does the Bible say about sin? You can't just simply turn to one place and say, okay, this is what the Bible says about sin. No, you have to look at the whole scope of Scripture, and then after doing that, then we come to conclusions, this is what the Bible says about sin, or about humanity, or about our fallenness, all those sorts of things. That really is where our doctrine comes from. So it's very practical stuff. It really is just biblical stuff that that is sort of the spark notes. You know, it kind of brings it all down for us so that we can grasp it easily and, and latch on to it. <clears throat> and one such doctrine is called justification. Now, this is a legal term. Justification is the act in which God has acquitted us of the very sin of which we are guilty. God has justified us in and through the work of Jesus Christ. Practically speaking, we can say that our justification is complete. Jesus has done everything necessary to bring about our salvation, and God has declared those who are in Christ to be justified. So God has rendered his judgment that we are not guilty because our guilt has been transferred to Jesus, who has given us in exchange his righteousness. It really is an amazing transaction. Jesus has taken our sin upon himself and given us in exchange his righteousness. And we have what John calls here an advocate with the Father. Now that word advocate is a Greek word that uh, parakleton, which comes from paraclete. You may have heard that word before. And it simply means one who comes alongside. He's given us one who is able to come alongside and walk this journey and stand before the, the Father in our stead. Now, one theologian made the point, our advocate, our paraclete, does not plead our innocence before God. Rather, he acknowledges our guilt, but presents his sacrifice as full grounds for our acquittal. John then says, he, meaning the advocate, who's identified as Jesus, we know who it is, is the propitiation for our sins. 
It's another long word we don't use very much, huh? When was the last time you used that in a sentence? Propitiation. Uh, it's also sometimes translated as expiation. We don't use that word either. But what it is, it describes the action of God in removing our guilt. And that happens through this transfer, our sin being transferred to Jesus. And we can live in the assurance that our justification is absolutely complete. It is an action that is totally of God. There's nothing that we could do or could have done in order to earn it or deserve it or merit it. There's nothing that we can do to add to it. It's God's action on our behalf to ultimately declare us not guilty because of what Jesus has done, because Jesus has taken our sin upon himself. It really is, you knew I was going to use this word, it's hesed. You know, that Old Testament word that I'm totally obsessed with now. Uh, it's a word that defines the character of God. It's used hundreds of times in the Old Testament. It's translated all sorts of ways. Mercy, grace. The word loving kindness was actually invented to translate the word hesed into English. And you know the definition that we're using for hesed. When the one from whom you should expect to receive nothing gives you everything, that is hesed. That is grace. That is God's loving kindness. Therefore, we stand redeemed by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That is our reality in Jesus Christ. And for those who are truly in Christ, nothing can change that reality. Not even you can change that reality. Remember, there's nothing you can do to make God love you any more or any less. But the presence of sin has not been completely eradicated from our lives. And that's the quirky thing in all of this. We still have to deal with being sinners even though we are redeemed sinners. Our sin has been and will be forgiven. It is nonetheless present. We experience temptation. We still make mistakes. There are things that we ought to do that we don't do. There are things that we ought not to do that we do. That does not, however, change the fact that this extraordinary transformation has already taken place in our hearts. We who have lived in darkness have been called out of that darkness and into God's marvelous light. We know the reality of forgiveness. We know the joy of having the chains of sin broken. Our justification is complete, and even our sanctification, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, does nothing to add to our justification. Sanctification, or the process by which we continue to reflect the image of Christ in, in more and more ways, is a process. Justification is something that happens Sanctification is an ongoing process. We continue to grow in our faith. We continue to grow in our obedience, which leads more and more to us taking on the character of Christ in our own lives. And it's this kind of cooperative action that God does with us and in us and through us by the power of his Holy Spirit. I've titled this whole series that you may know, and I think that uh, the theme that John wants us to, to see here is that there are certain things that we can absolutely know because we are followers of Jesus. And he wants us to know that our lives are hid in Christ. He wants us to know that we have been redeemed. And he wants us to know that we are continually abiding in him. But the question becomes, how do we know that we're in Christ in the first place? And how can we be sure that we're progressing in our faith. If these are realities, how do we experience those realities? How do we step forward into those realities? And John gives us the answer. He does it in verse 3. He says, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Obedience becomes the sure sign that we are in Christ. 
The acid test when it comes to faith is that what we experience within ultimately makes its way out of us and into the way that we live our lives. And obedience is the same sure sign that we're continuing to walk in that faith. Verse 6 says, whoever says uh, he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that he walked. Let me give you an example of this from life. I know what it is uh, to be clean, and I know what it is to be dirty. And there was a time in my life uh, when I went from being content with dirty to preferring clean. Now, anyone who has children recognize that children often are quite content with dirty. They're happy to stay dirty. They don't want to take a bath or a shower. I don't need to. I'm okay. They rebel against such things. And then for most of them, fortunately, there comes a time when when something changes. And clean is seen as a better option. I can still remember um, the second trip that I took to Haiti. A group of guys, we were going up into the mountains uh, above Port-au-Prince in order to build a classroom onto a Christian school. And, and so basically we were going to Haiti to dig a trench. We were, we were digging the footers by hand. Couldn't get equipment there. Dig footers by hand. Well, we got there after dark and were transported in the back of a pickup truck, this winding road going up into the mountains of Haiti. And it's probably a good thing it was dark so that we could not actually see the drop-off that was right beside us as we were making our way up there. We get there, and of course it's dark, and our accommodations are, are pretty sparse, to say the least. Cinder block building with a concrete floor and a tin roof, no windows, no doors. The bathroom consisted in what we would refer to as an outhouse, uh, and we found that this little dwelling had no source of water, uh, which meant uh, the only water that was available was bottled water, And we needed that for drinking and also for preparing our meals throughout the week. And there was a limited supply. It had to last us through the week. Well, we worked our first day, hard work, (laughs) digging in this uh, rocky Haitian soil uh, under a blistering Haitian sun. And by the end of the day, as you might imagine, we were covered with dirt and uh, sweat, and it was a miserable feeling. Even these years later, I can remember how desperately I wanted a shower after working all day in the hot Haitian sun. I was not looking forward to sleeping in that condition, but there was no water. Uh, My coworkers and I were trapped in the grime and sweat of the day. But God was good. Uh, Perhaps he knew that these soft Americans needed some help transitioning into the week they were going to have. And so um, after dinner, a random rainstorm happened. Uh, They had not had rain probably for months, and I'm not sure that they had it for months Afterward, But this one evening, it was like a cloud appeared right over top of us, and it started to rain. You've never seen a group of guys scramble to get out of dirty clothes and into bathing suits so that we could stand under the eaves of that uh, tin roof and, and allow the water to cascade over us. And uh, we were able to uh, enjoy in that moment what it was again to be clean. I remember uh, such a sense of joy and thanksgiving for this just, this little gift of a rainstorm. Well, that was the last rain we had through the rest of the week, and so the rest of the week we basically stayed the way that we were. Uh, The last night that we were there, we did go and stay in a place that had showers, which was good news for those who were going to be on the plane with us coming back to the U.S., Um, we were able to get clean again. All of this is to say, I know what it's like to be dirty. 
I know what it's like to be clean. Why would we ever want to go back to that way of life? Knowing the joy of being clean in the Lord, why would we ever want to go back to the grimy life of sin? See, once we've been called out of darkness, why would we ever want to go back to that place where we don't experience God's light? When we come to Christ, a change takes place. Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. We are transformed. We become new creatures and we become a part of a new creation that God is doing. And John tells us that the sure sign that that transformation has taken place and continues to take place in our lives is the way we live. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Being in Christ and truly experiencing the grace and forgiveness of God creates within us a desire for obedience. God, out of our love and gratitude, uh, out of our love and gratitude for God, we just want to respond and tell God how much we love Him and how much we desire to be in the midst of His purpose and plan for our lives. We don't obey in order to gain God's favor. We do it because we've already experienced God's blessing, God's grace. And that's true for each one of us. The blessing has already come. It's just a matter of appropriating it to our lives. God's grace has is, is been lavished upon us. The question is whether we will receive it and live in it. And the way that we see that we are living in it that we are living out of it is that we respond to God's love and mercy and grace through our love and through our loving obedience to the one who came and lived and died and rose again for us. And this table that's set before us shows us the extent to which God was willing to go to redeem each one of us to call us back to himself, to call us out of darkness and into his light. This table represents the cleansing power of Jesus Christ who hung on a cross in a place where we should have been hanging, but who took our place and took our sins upon himself so that he could give us the gift of his righteousness. So as you come to this table, come seeking to repent of those things that have pulled you away from God this week. Come recognizing the joy of being clean once again in the Lord. Come recognizing the God of the universe, the one who created you, desires to have you sit at table with him and enjoy this fellowship. Let's prepare our hearts to come to the table as we just sing that little chorus, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Afresh on me. The Apostle Paul records in his letter to the Corinthian Christians that says this, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
The same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that once again you would do that transforming work in our hearts and lives. That we would understand that as we take this simple loaf of bread and this cup, that we are able to proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus until he comes again. And so it is with thanksgiving that we receive these simple gifts. And we're grateful for the way in which they remind us of the transformation that's taken place in our hearts and lives as we have come to faith in Christ. So set these common things apart from their common to a holy use and use them to speak your word of grace once again into our hearts and lives. And all this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after after supper, Jesus took the cup, said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. Paul reminds us that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Once again, O God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts because you have called us out of darkness because you have justified us through the sacrifice of your son Jesus, because you were willing to provide the sacrifice, even as you did for Abraham long ago, you've provided the perfect sacrifice for us through your son. We pray that as we continue to have that taste within our mouths, that we would be reminded of your deep love and mercy and grace. That our lives are secure in your hands. That indeed there's nothing we can do to make you love us more or less. But you've invited us to show our love, to respond to your love by living lives of obedience. And we pray that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would help us to do that. And all this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And you'll find that in your worship materials.
since that day. I know that God is saving faith to me. He did in part, nor how believing in His word brought peace within my heart. But I know who I have believed in and am persuaded. As you go out into God's world today, go recognizing that you go as the redeemed, those whose sin has been covered, those who have been invited out of darkness and into the light, those who know, who know that your lives are hid in Christ. So as you go, go reflecting that in the way you live. Go walking in the way that he walked so others will see Jesus in you and be drawn to him and to God's wonderful mercy and grace. Go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, abide with you, uplift you, and empower you both now and forevermore. Amen. And let me give you one word before we head out. Next week is a special Sunday. Our youth are going to be here with us. <clears throat> We're going to have five seniors who deliver short sermons, so you're not going to want to miss that. Be a part of that worship service. Uh, make sure that you tune in or show up here next week, either downstairs at 8.30 or here at 10 o'clock. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.